Uh, good morning. My name is Alan Crandall, a professor of ophthalmology at the Moranai Center at the University of Utah. And today we're going to discuss nuclear disassembly techniques. Slide two. There are no inconsequential steps to good fake emulsification. And by that, I mean exactly that. You have to make the stab incision correct. You have to make the main incision correct. Uh, yeah, certainly, it's very important to understand the, the physics of performing a good capsule rexus. Um, and also, you have to understand the physics of the OBDs, uh, ophthalmic viscoelastic devices. And we'll talk a little bit about that. <laughs> and then also, the physics of the actual fake emulsification uh, technology. Next slide. The, there are, the strategy for each type of cataract should vary with the hardness of the nucleus. For example, it's hard to do some techniques in very soft nucleus. That's, we see that in pediatric cases. We see that in somebody who has uh, congenital cataracts that need to be removed when they're in their 20s and 30s. Their, their nucleus is not very hard, and if one tries to do a divide and conquer technique or a chop technique, it's not going to work in that type of nucleus. So in a soft nucleus, I usually flip it, bring the nuclear chip up, and then remove it at the plane of the iris. Uh, most cataracts, and certainly in someone who's over 60, they're likely to be what we would say is a two to a three plus nucleus. Now in that type of nucleus, I, you should learn to do a divide and conquer technique, uh, Pre-chop is an excellent technique, and then most people have converted to some form of either horizontal <coughs> or vertical chop techniques, and we'll certainly go over those. When it comes to white cataracts, there are multiple ways of, of dealing with them, but one of the most important things is to do uh, to stain the capsule with uh, some device. You could use ICG, but most effective is the uh, uh, tri uh, Tripan Blue. And that's, of course, if both of those are FDA approved for the, that technique. Uh, it is also, in white cataracts, it's, again, very important to understand what the OBD is going to, how it's going to help you or it could hinder, hinder the, the case. And we'll talk about that. And then in, with very hard techniques, there's a combination of techniques that we use. Most of the time, a stop and chop type of technique uh, works very well. But don't forget small incision extra cap. Uh, that's a technique that we use a lot when we're visiting third world, but it's also a very important technique to understand, even in, in a few cases in developed countries. If we look at the, a divide and conquer technique, this is still the number one technique used in the United States for most surgeons. It's, it, it, you divide it into a four different p components. But basically, the, the two most important ones are the uh, non-occlusive phase, which is sculpting. And what I mean by that is what you do is you, you need the power that you need to, to make the nucleus not, or to allow the nucleus so it doesn't move while you're, while you're uh, sculpting out the, the grooves. And then you rotate, and rotation needs to be done very elegantly. And what we try to do, we may even do that in a bimanual uh, type of technique where we use two instruments to rotate. It's a little more uh, zonular friendly. And the, so, and the power that you would use then, usually I would start with, I, in my foot positions, obviously in foot position three, I, I would use a linear uh, modality so that I can increase the power. So just to the point where I can debride the nucleus, debulk it, and not use any, uh, and you have to use enough power so that the nuclear material doesn't move, because that's very uh, zonular, uh, uh, stressful if you do that. So the two, uh, the rotation and sculpting are need to be done very elegantly, and that you want to make sure that you use enough power so the nuclear material doesn't doesn't move. And then you have the quadrant removal uh, portion, and sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll actually divide the. Uh, cataract into six or seven pieces depending on its hardness. And in, a, in the quadrant or this type of, of removal technique, you use occlusion and power modulation to, uh, and that's where you really have to understand the difference between a burst mode, a linear mode, 
or, or a pulse mode. You want, what you want to do is figure out which modality allows you to bring the pieces in. And, and again, there, there needs to be some occlusion to get it to the point where you want it. But after that, you don't want occlusion. You want the material to keep coming in. And I'll show you a complication that can occur if you don't understand that. In our next slide, the, the, we will hopefully see. So this is what's known as a torsional. Uh, this, this, you can see here that in a traditional technique, the, the tip is moving forward and backwards. Uh, and in a torsional or ellipse type of technique, the tip is not only moving forward, but it's rotating. And what that does is it prevents the tip from being totally occluded. And again, it, if you don't have occlusion, you won't get any problem with the posterior capsule, uh, such as uh, can happen if you break your occlusion and you get surge. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Choppers uh, are important to have and, and important to understand. The chopper that we see here on this, on this next slide is a variation of a Nagahara, but it, and it's a sharp tip. It, they come, any uh, of the companies, uh, all of the ones in India, China, the U.S. and Europe, the, everybody makes a version which is similar to this. And the, the tip, as you see here uh, on this slide, is very sharp and it allows you to uh, go through the nucleus and to chop a piece off. We, we have to understand that. So there are two types of, of chopping. One is known as a horizontal chop. Now on a horizontal chop, what you do is your phaco tip, it's important that it is occluded so you're going to, and you go back to foot position two. So you, go, you bury the tip in foot position three. When you hear the, the bell showing that you have occlusion, you want to drop back to foot position two so that you have it, you're, it's still occluded, but you have control of the nucleus. And then with the horizontal, you, you take your chopper, it goes under the capsule rexus, out to the, to the edge of the nuclear material, and then the the t the, uh, the handpiece, this part doesn't move because if it moves, you'll you'll flip off the the piece, and the uh, chopper then is drawn toward the uh, occluded tip, and then right before you get to it, you move move the instrument to the right, uh, and the chopper is slightly to the left, and that will split the nucleus. In a vertical chop, which I is actually my favorite way of chopping, what, it, what happens is the, the uh, chopper, and again there are different kinds, a Nagahara chopper for example has a soft bottom so it, per, it, it doesn't work great in hard nuclei but it's safe in, in a 2 to 3 or 4 plus nucleus. And in this case again you have to make sure that you bury the tip, allow it to occlude, once it occludes slowly get off of the phaco handpiece and don't move it because if you one of the things that people that are just learning how to chop do wrong is they're still in foot position three and they're backing their hand up and what that does of course is push off the nuclear piece and then if that happens you can't you don't have occlusion you can't chop and so you see when people are just converting to this they tend to move their hand their hand position back and that that pushes the nucleus off, you have no control. So in this case, again, we bury the tip, and you can see that we're buried all, way, all the way to the sleeve, so that w this tip is under your control, and the, the, the nucleus material is under your control. Then you bring in the, the chopper, and you go straight down to, to just past the nuclear tip, and then your left hand does the work, your right hand stays exactly stable, the left hand goes down. Once you get past two-thirds of the nucleus, a movement to the left can be used and that will split the nucleus material. So again, the two type of uh, techniques, vertical, your tip is, I, and the reason I like vertical, by the way, is because you're inside, you can see it, you're inside the capsule, there's no risk about when, when you do horizontal, sometimes you can't see your chopping piece and it's, it's possible that you can grab the uh, a nuclear, past the nucleus and grab the either posterior capsule because you're going to be fairly close to it out there, or you can be, go too far and actually pop through the capsular bag in that zone. So I would, I, that's why I personally like the vertical 
uh, chop technique, but they, they both are very effective. So in this uh, uh, slide, the, we're looking at a chop technique, and you can see that we have, we're, we're in foot position two, uh, the ultrasound is off, we have a reasonably uh, slow but, but good aspiration flow rate, and we have high vacuum. So that means I have now control over this piece and my chopper now has gone down through the tip, this is a vertical chop, and then out and it splits the nuclear material. Here's another example of a slightly different uh, nucleus. The other one was a little bit harder, so sometimes what you see, again, what you see here, we are now in foot position two. We have ultrasound zero, so again, if you have any ultrasound, that tip will be moving, even if it's a slight, and then, then, you, then you're not occluded, and you won't have uh, the ability to, uh, to chop it. But it, now here you'll, say, you'll notice that the vacuum isn't very high. It turns out it, it, isn't, it, it isn't critical how high that vacuum is unless the nucleus is very hard, be, because in this two to three plus nucleus, 79, which isn't much, allows me still to control this nuclear piece, and then my chopping instrument can go down and uh, uh, break the nucleus in, into quadrants. If for quadrant removal, however, again, we want to decide what our, our, understand the FACO physics. You'll see here, I, this, is a, uh, this is an ozzle, which means the tip will vibrate this way and this way. So that prevents occlusion uh, unless you get high vacuums. And if you look over here, so you see that I'm in foot position three. Uh, the uh, bottle height is about 100, so it, you're, you're keeping the chamber deep with that, that modality. Aspiration flow rate, you can set it. If you want things to happen fast, what I would do in, in a normal nucleus is I'd have the aspiration flow rate at about uh, 33 to 36, and that, that allows for things to be uh, moving fairly quickly. Then over on this side, you see that I have, in my power, I have both regular longitudinal, and I have a torsional. And the reason I do that is I want the tip to move forward to, to grab the piece and the torsional to prevent occlusion. And that, what that allows you to do is under these uh, irrigation 100, uh, in this case, uh, the, the aspiration flow rate, I can, it's, it's on a uh, linear modality. We're right now at 25, which means things are happening relatively slowly. But if I go to the, to the top of the aspiration flow rate, I can get it up to 33, 35, and that, again, will pr make things move quickly. Below that is a term that says the rise time. And you, you notice that it's set to, what, what happens then is that as soon as the tip is occluded, you are telling the machine to slow down when you have a negative rise time. And if you want, again, things to happen quickly, you would have a positive. That would, that would speed up the aspiration flow rate. So when I'm teaching residents, I will usually have the machine slow down when it's occluded so that nothing happens very quickly. And then I have linear control of the vacuum, which I, which I use different amounts of vacuum to keep things moving at the, at the FACO tip. If there's no occlusion, you can't pop the, the posterior capsule because you will not develop surge. Uh, so what you have to understand is if you hear the ding, the machine saying you're in an occlusion mode, you have two, two uh, capabilities. One would be to go ahead and go back to foot position two. The problem there is you're still occluded. So it's, I don't like that modality. What I usually do is just slightly increase my power so that it moves the t uh, the, through the tip so it's not no longer occluded. Uh, so you just want to slowly raise your FACO power, and in this case, I would go your your longitudinal would probably go up to about 25, 30, 40 percent, and then that pushes the nuclear piece off, prevents occlusion, and prevents both surge and wound wound, which we're going to see here. So in this video, we'll see a number of different uh, techniques. In this case, we're going to you'll see that the FACO tip is going to be buried. Into the, in the nucleus, and then the second instrument comes, and it easily allows me to, to crack. So again, go to foot position three, back to foot position two, 
and then your, your other hand, your left hand, your non-dominant hand, whatever that is, then uh, proceeds to, to do the, the actual cracking. So see here again, once again, you're in foot position two, and you can do a little three if you, if you have good control of the nucleus. Now, in, uh, if you look at this video here, this is a drawing of what a nuclear, um, any kind of cataract looks like. And you have, you have to understand the lines that are, that are more or less natural. Those lines will allow you to divide the nucleus in, into, its, uh, in, into the quadrants or six or eight pieces. So you see here the, the phaco hand piece comes in, it goes, this left hand, do, right hand does not move, dominant hand does not move and the second hand removes it. So here you can see, in the, again, in this cartoon ver version of it, the second instrument comes in. Again, here this is going to be a horizontal crack. So we now have occlusion, no movement, and the non-dominant hand comes towards the tip and moves to the, to the side. And that's what you saw on the previous uh, uh, machine. And th th this, again, is a horizontal chop. So you'll see uh, an, uh, the other version, which again I like the, a lot, is the so-called vertical chopping, which means really basically that you're going str down through the nucleus inside the capsular rexus, which again I feel is just a little bit safer than doing it uh, from a horizontal technique. But it's important to uh, really understand both of these and understand what foot positions you, you, you would like to be in. So again, there we have our vertical and our horizontal. So we'll see here, this again, we're another uh, hand piece. You see them in even a uh, slight uh, modality of, of three, as long as you have good control of the nucleus. Here's another uh, chop technique, very, ver and here you can see, once you have control, you can actually use, you can make multiple chops with even just one uh, good grab of the, of the nuclear piece. Here again, you see that, that second instrument's chopped down and moves out. We, one of the things that we did is we made ch um, uh, a video showing this actual technique, which is embedded in this, uh, in this slide, and we're using what's known as a Miyake view. So you are now looking at a, uh, from the vitreous side, and you can see the, the zonules here, and you can see the uh, ciliary processes. And so <clears throat> this allows us to analyze all the different types of techniques which are safe which are, and how they work. And, and this, we do this on uh, lots of different things. We do it on CTRs, we do it on different uh, implants, we do it on, ch in this case, we're doing it on a CHOP technique to look at what we have to do to understand the uh, modality so that, you, you, again, you're not going to break, break through. So here again we'll do a horizontal uh, chop, the hand piece goes out, we're not occluded, and then we go into the nuclear chip, bury it, the, the chopper is then brought to the tip, and you notice that the right hand or dominant hand is not moving, whereas the, the uh, non-dominant hand does most of the work. So the, you see there's a little safety soft tip at the end of this chopper, uh, and you, you, again, the, the different choppers for different uh, types of modalities. So this would be a horizontal chop. The phaco hand piece is all, almost doing nothing but stabilizing the nucleus, and the second non-dominant hand is then drawn toward the nucleus and out, which then splits it. These are, this is hard to do. So in that case, what I do is I, is I rebury the tip a little further deep, and I s just slowly go down, splitting out these, these actual pieces into the different quadrants. So you can see here on the, on the vertical and horizontal chop, it's really critical to understand that. So here, let's just look at this. You can see again, we're, uh, no movement of the, with the dominant hand. The non-dominant hand is, is what I, is actually cracking. And once it's into its uh, pieces, whether that's four, six, or eight, then you, you switch to a uh, quadrant removal technique which again, uh, what you want to do is you want to bring the piece to this, what we call a safety zone, which is in the middle of the capsular rexus, just above the capsular bag, but in either plane of the iris or slightly low. 
that protects the um, uh, endothelium from uh, the phaco energy and also from from the uh, the fluid fluid that's maintaining the chamber uh, balance. In this case, you see we don't have a lot of height, uh, but but we're we're at about oh probably 70 or 80 uh, mil millimeters of mercury above the um, capsular bag. So uh, all of those once one understands that. And this, this, so this video is, is designed for you to, to, to allow you to replay and look at the different, uh, different modalities so that you truly understand each of these, this, this part of the technique. So uh, you will see there, there will be Miyake views and then there'll be, uh, those will be followed by standard uh, uh, cataract technique. And you, you'll notice that some of these videos are not of the new uh, machines such as the uh, Infinity or, or Centurion because the physics doesn't change. Once you understand, you don't, you don't have to have the most, uh, the newest and most uh, valued uh, new materials because this, the physics works. Now you see here, this is the, one of the first things that we need to do when we're chopping and that's to make sure that we have good hydro dissection and so what I like to do is I use what's known as either a Chang cannula or any, or any cannula to, for hydro dissecting. And you can see right here that what I'm going to do here is what's known as the flip technique. So this is a soft nucleus. So rather than actually uh, trying to break it into multiple pieces, what, I, what I've done is I've flipped the nucleus into the, uh, just a, I, so it's aiming towards my uh, uh, hand and, and my, you know, my, uh, in this case, temporal incision, my left hand, which is my non-dominant hand, will then be used to really stabilize the nucleus. And again, this is a softer tech, uh, cataract, and these are very difficult uh, to try, divide, and conquer because you don't have enough material to grab. And you can see here that the second non-dominant hand is actually holding it in position so I can chop off the, the top of the nucleus then I will use an occlusion mode, uh, quadrant removal type of mode to simply uh, bring the, each of these pieces up. And you see that the, the dominant uh, FACO handpiece stays right near the center of the uh, capsularexis. So you want most of the action to, to occur right in the middle of the rexis. So your, your actual hand, FACO handpiece needs to be slightly uh, past half, the halfway point toward your temporal incision because that will then allow the piece to be emulsified in the actual center of the, the cataract. And it's also important to really understand, again, you, the, the incision is critical. A square incision will usually be uh, very easy to, uh, to um, uh, manipulate, but more importantly, those are the kind that are uh, uh, you can, uh, at the end, hyd hydro hydrate the wound and bring the, the wound seal completely so it doesn't need excision. Some, in some of our, of our procedures, we also have to deal with pupils, uveitis, glaucoma patients, and this, is, this part of the video shows what, uh, a way of, of opening the uh, small pupil. Most of the time now, I would use a Malugan ring, which is made by MST. Uh, no financial uh, arrangements for me, unfortunately. And then, uh, so what I've done here is use what's, what's known as a, a beeler. It's a splitting, it's a uh, device that allows you to, to stretch the uh, pupil in, in different pieces. And one of the things that we know, once we have the uh, uh, capsular, uh, uh, or the iris open at least five to six millimeters, there is no problem with doing the chop techniques. Uh, one of the things that I would encourage folks to do nowadays, because we, we now know that if we uh, leave any cortex, eventually what's going to happen is that you're going to either get a, a Sommering's ring uh, problem and then you're going to, you can get iris chafing and you get pigmentary dispersion. And also, mo most importantly, you're going to get capsule phimosis. The capsule phimosis then stretches the zonules, and particularly in, in trauma cases, Marfan's cases, and pseudoexfoliation, which we really deal with a lot, 
you're, you're running the risk of having the capsule phimosis and then spontaneous subluxation. So one of the, th uh, we used to teach how to do small pupil phaco, and it can be done, but I would really encourage you not to do that. Uh, the, the technique is doable, but again, I think we leave, we don't do a good uh, cortical cleanup. And nowadays, I think it's important not only to, to do a cortical cleanup, but also to really make sure you remove the anterior lens epithelial cells by using a Singer sweep. So this, this part of the, of the video that you'll ha is about 41 minutes long, just giving different uh, ways of doing uh, uh, different techniques. So we won't really discuss each of those. But you'll see the, the maneuver we were just talking about is when, do you, when does one use a, uh, some type of device that can stabilize the bag. Uh, there now are a, a number of different types of, of devices. The, this, the one you're seeing on the video now is a Sioni uh, variation of a capsular tension ring. And the, so the eyelet sits above the capsule and then can be used to, uh, um, to stabilize. In other, and usually we suture that to the, to the scleron. If the patient's over 65 or 70, then I think you can use 9-O-proline that we know they last usually at least 15 years and, it, uh, and it's the needles that they come on are very, very nice. Nowadays, we would use 8-O-Gore-Tex in anybody that's uh, un younger than certainly uh, 60, I use, I use Gore-Tex because it should last indefinitely. This is an off-label use of the technique of the uh, Gore-Tex suture. So it's important to have your, so your patient knows that you're using something that, that is, has been proven to be uh, safe and to last a lot longer, but that it is not FDA approved for that, that technology. And so again, and, and, and th this part of the video, you'll see we're using different iris hooks and different, uh, you, can, you have capsule hooks now that are made both by F FIC, which is called the um, um, McCool hook, and the MST hooks, which are designed for the capsular bag. I like them a lot better than these, these uh, uh, iris hooks because they're designed to stabilize the bag. It's also important to, to understand the, the capsular tension segment, which is designed by a uh, previous fellow, Ike Ahmed, when, while he was here at Moran, and what, what this is, 120 degree uh, PMMA with the eyelet sticking up so you can actually use it as a hanger. Uh, what, I, what I do is I put it into the capsular bag, it sits just above the eyelet, sits above the, the, the capsular rexus, and then you can use a, just a simple iris hook and, mo and move that iris hook that you originally had holding the, the iris and then put it into the capsular device. And what that does is it makes it a, a hanger, and you can you can convert uh, a very difficult case into a more or less standard case. Sometimes I will use two of these devices, and it makes it uh, very easy. And again, in the video, you'll you'll notice that we are now showing a uh, Miyake view. To, you know, it's nice to understand where these devices are and and how they uh, sit in the capsule bag. If you're going to use a capsular tension segment, you have to understand that it doesn't do it, it provides the holding capability in that 120 degrees, but it doesn't open the full bag. So I almost will always use a, um, a capsular tension segment at the same time. So usually when you're using a, ca a capsular tension segment, you need a, a full uh, capsular, uh, capsular bag opening with the any of the devices. I usually like to use a CTR, capsule tension ring, that is as large as, as you need. I almost always use at least the 14 millimeter one, unless the eye is very hyperopic, uh, in which case I'll go to a smaller one, or if there's uh, pediatric cases, I will usually use about a 12 and a half millimeter uh, capsule tension ring, along with the capsule tension segments. So we'll be switching back and forth between the, again, you can see here a very dislocated uh, t uh, posterior bag, and yet we can, we can convert it safely with the hook. You can see that we can now proceed to uh, re removing the uh, cataract and then suture it to the sclera at any point in time. About 31 minutes of, 
uh, videos with each of these different type of techniques. So mm -hmm. you can see how to use them and with an AC tear, uh, uh, which remember, you, if you have an anterior tear of your capsular rexus, you can't use a CTR because it'll split it out. But you can use a capsular tension segment and you can use uh, the iris devices or, or capsule devices to, to allow you to finish the, the, the procedure. And so we have a different uh, ways of looking at the different devices. So, so in, in this, uh, this uh, video segment, you can take your time, go back and forth, and look at, look at all these pieces. The, uh, another technique that I think is underutilized is what's known as a pre-chop technique. This has uh, been around for a number of years. It's been uh, popularized by uh, Akahoshi in Japan. And uh, he, he and I have been teaching courses on this for about 15 years. It, and it's important to understand what, what it's, the value is that you can divide the nucleus into as many pieces as you want with, the, with this uh, pre-chopper. And what it does is it allows you to, to, to divide the nucleus with no flow. So there's, there's value in certainly uh, cases where you have uh, IFIS, intra, uh, I, I, iris, floppy iris, intracapsular floppy iris syndrome. Uh, and w if, no, if there's no flow, then you get the pieces into a quadrant and you can very easily remove them uh, at any point in time. Uh, this is the Akahoshi version. I have a slightly different design version, which I use for femtosecond uh, uh, divide pre-chop and also for very hard nuclei. The pre-chopper can be used up to about four to five plus, and then after that it won't, it won't bury in the tip. So you see what we do is we just simply put the, the device into the capsule bag just below the uh, uh, midsection or even to the lower uh, posterior uh, segment, and then just split them, uh, split the nucleus, and then rotate and, and do that again. So here's a, a the video just showing uh, what's, what 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 we do. A lot of times, uh, when most of the time, I actually don't use dilating drops prior to doing the cataract surgery. Uh, I like to have the capability of doing it on the table, and I'm using, as you saw there, it opens up very very quickly. So here's the pre-chopper. It goes in just past the center of the, of the midline, and then you just simply open the, it up. And the most important thing is to make sure that you have the crack going all the way through to the, to the back of the lens. So here you see the, the nucleus has been rotated, and now we have it in, into quadrants with no uh, flow. And now we can put our, since it's already in a quadrant, we have to sometimes debulk a little bit to, to bring these pe uh, pieces up. Talk a little bit about different kind of phaco tips. Uh, the standard uh, tip is what's known as a Kelman tip, and it comes in different degrees, zero degrees. Uh, an actual Kelman usually means it has some kind of bend at the tip. Most of the time, the bend is so that the, the phaco tip is, uh, you, you, you can see your cutting device as it goes through. This, what you're looking at on the video here, is what's known as a reverse Kelman. So the tip is aimed towards the posterior capsule. Most uh, folks are not comfortable with that until they get used to, again, understanding the physics. of There's the physics, all the energy is going back toward the posterior capsule. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it, when you first start to convert to this, it, it looks a little scary because the piece, the phaco tip is is down, but it, I find it to be a much more efficient way of removing the nuclear pieces. And you can see here I'm in a burst mode. And why do I do a burst mode? Yeah, again, you have to understand the physics of these different uh, uh, modalities. Longitudinal means the tip is going forward and, and backwards. Any kind of an ellipse or, or uh, torsional means the tip is moving sideways. And a burst mode means that when you go into foot position three, you are, uh, you, as you go down further, you're increasing the, the amount of bursts per second. So you could go as one burst per second, two bursts per second, all the way up to a continuous mode. Um, and that allows me to decide uh, what, what is the most efficient for different types of nuclei. Uh, most people would just use a pulse mode. The nice thing about a pulse mode 
is, is the, you know that the machine is, is working usually 30 to 40 pulses per second. So it's off on, off on, off on. And the advantage of that is it decreases the amount of energy and you can control how much linear power you're uh, adding to reduce, to remove the nuclear pieces. So again, you have to understand the ability to, when you're in put position three, you want, your hand, you want the nuclear pieces to continue to, to move towards the tip. You don't want occlusion, so you just increase the, the uh, burst per second if you happen to be in a burst mode, or you increase the power if you're in a pulse mode, because you're in burst, you're controlling the amount of burst per second. In, in the, um, the pulse mode, you, you can set it to 20 bursts per, or bursts per second to 30, even up to 60, and the advantage again there is, is to d decrease the amount of, of energy while keeping the tip moving. So let's go to, in this case, here's a, another uh, FACO uh, pre-chop, and you'll notice that there's a Malugan ring, which is made by MST, um, and, I, and there are variations also made by our lab in, um, in India. So there's a capability of getting this, these, this device everywhere. And Malugan, I like because it has the four uh, holding device right there, but also there, you really have eight points of contact. So it's, it, to me, it's really nice for, this, for these IFIS cases. And so here's another pre-chop. Uh, this cap, this rexus, or the pupillary opening is probably only six, uh, which I think is, is enough. Again, I encourage people not to, to do small pupil phaco. You can do it, but you will not, you won't be able to uh, see your peripheral, your peripheral uh, nuclear pieces. It's very easy to, to leave one or two, but more importantly, you le you're going to leave too much uh, cortex, and that's going to lead to capsule phimosis and also to so further increase your chance for late dislocation, especially in these um, in cases of pseudoexfoliation. So the, the video here will show a number of, of the pre-chops. And again, the second instrument, once you, it's still nice to have good, good control. You see the aspiration flow rate up here is uh, 35, so things will happen fairly quickly. And what I usually do, particularly on a hard nucleus, is I, uh, when I get to the last piece, I'm going to reduce the aspiration flow rate to, to a much lower number so things don't happen very quickly. And then we change the on-off over here. You can see this is a, 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 a burst mode where I have a T on. In other words, when I, every time I hit foot position three, the power is, uh, is 70, 70 milliseconds on and the rest of the time off. And again, you can change those power modulations depending on the hardness of the, uh, of the cataract. Now this is again a, a small pupil, and uh, again, you, you'll see that we can easily do it. And in this case, what, I try to, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get the capsule rexus underneath the iris, because I know the iris is only five millimeters, and I think we want our, our rexus to be at least uh, five and a half for all pseudoexfoliations, and that no reason that that shouldn't be the case in, in all these. Again, here we can divide this nuclear pe the, uh, uh, nucleus into four quadrants, or eight sometimes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that, and then we can remove those. Again, the video will just show you the, that capability, but I really, again, encourage you to make sure that you get all the cortex out and you still do lens epithelial sweeping to remove that possibility. The, the other thing to understand is there, the reason there are all these different tips is that each tip has, uh, allows you to do different, uh, different modalities. I use a reverse Kelman because as I say the energy is down uh, and so all the FACO power is delivered inside the capsular bag, but the, if you're going to do chopping techniques, a reverse Kelman is not the best. So what I would suggest is something you can bury the tip easily. So if you're going to do a full chop, then what you want is either a zero or 15 degree standard Kelman tip. They're the easiest to bury, particularly the zero degree, which you can occlude that tip very, very easily. Then you have full control to bring in your horizontal or your vertical chopping technique. And you can refer back to that video to look at those, those different modalities.
So again, you have understanding the physics of what you're doing is, is critical. So in this case, what you're, what you're seeing here is, I want you to look at, at the, this uh, wound here, and, but also note, note on this uh, video overlay here in just a second. So you, if you look, we, we'll show you that back, I'll back that up and show that again. There, there was a point when there was no nuclear material at the FACO tip, and yet the, 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 uh, the machine is telling you it's occluded. And the problem with that, it means that the, the FACO tip is clogged. And you say, well, it's not a big deal. Well, it is because the FACO tip then heats, and in less than a millisecond, certainly uh, way less than a second, you're going to have a corneal burn. And you can already see the whitening of this uh, wound edge here. And also you note that the, the, new, the, the FACO tip is at the edge of that incision, which, which again means there's no flow around it, and, and you're going to get a, a wound burn. It turns out that if, you're, if you look, uh, this happens much more than it's, than it's reported, because most of the time it's just subtle and, and uh, doesn't uh, cause any problems. Many times, if it's, it, the whitening will be so bad and the gape will be so bad, you not only need sutures to, to close that wound, but often you have to advance or bring in uh, eye bank uh, sclera or cornea to, to aid in, in making sure that you don't have any uh, chance for endophthalmitis, which means the wound has to be 100% sealed. So. And can you comment then on um, techniques to avoid wound burn? Yes. So the, what? Yeah. So what you want to do one is to make sure that when that the hand pieces have been totally irrigated and and kept clean before each procedure. So make sure that 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 the technicians or your technicians are taught that at the end of every case they they must use at least uh, 60 to 100 cc's. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot of fluid to make sure that there's no retained viscoelastic or retained nuclear material in the tip because once what will happen is over, over the day that it's going to get worse at, with each additional case and at some point the, the, the tip will then be occluded and once it's occluded again very very short time before you've got a, a, burn, a wound burn. So one thing is to make sure that each tip is clean. The second thing is to make sure that things are, you got to watch your FACO tip and make sure that things are happening at the tip. And as soon as you see that the, the nucleus material is not at the FACO tip and you're, you're still hearing FACO power, you, you need to quickly go off, bring the tip out, clean it, or exchange it, and then, then you can resume. So you really have to be listening. You'll see here on this, on this one, there's a very short period where like right here, again, there's almost, uh, there's, things are not happening to the tip, and yet it's, the occlusion mode was, was uh, going off. So there, that's why they get a wound burned very, very quickly. And so you, you can see right here, there's, uh, it's, it's dinging, and we're not, we're not stopping what we're doing. So in this case, we're still putting energy into the eye, and the, nothing is happening at that FACO tip. So, so you gotta watch your FACO tip, and if you hear a ding, you either increase the power to move it, or in this case, come out. But again, you can see this, the wound is uh, really uh, at risk for a significant wound burn, which, which most many times isn't very dramatic, but it makes, uh, it, it, the wound then is not as good as it should be, and you increase your risk for endophthalmitis. So it's really critical to make sure that you have good occlusion. And then there, there are di different sizes of the tips, uh, 0.7 to 0.9 mini, mini flare tips, uh, reverse cummins, what I happen to like, the video will display that. And staying centered in the wound is another. Yeah, that's, we, we, we yeah, talked I'll about that. We want to make sure that. that already. Yeah, we did. We want to make sure that everything, when we're, when we're doing FACO, that the, the nuclear material is above the plane of the iris just barely, not high, so you don't damage endothelium, and that things are moving. So the phago tip itself needs to be just before the halfway point so that the nuclear material itself is in, is in the, 
most ex uh, expansive part of the uh, of the uh, capsular bag. You have to know which sleeves are designed for which size of your uh, uh, temporal wound. So uh, there are usually three different sleeves. One is for a, an incision that is less than two millimeters. That's called a nano sleeve. In other words, very thin. You, you have to be very controlled with your movements so you're not lifting and moving the, the uh, this incision because that'll that'll cause more of a burn. And why is it not doing that? So let me go back to the video. So we're doing here. Good. Now we're going to switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about uh, uh, white cataracts. These are very common in, in developing uh, second and third world uh, countries, uh, but also we do see it a fair amount even in developed, com uh, developed countries. And so uh, one thing you have to do is you have to understand staining. I use uh, almost always Tripam Blue. It's a very, very good way of uh, staining the capsule. Uh, there is evidence from German studies that have been done that it also makes the, the capsule a little bit tauter, so it makes uh, it much easier to, to really see the, the, the capsule as you, as you do your um, capsulorexis, and uh, it works really quite well. You can get these uh, in compounding pharmacies, but I, since uh, Dork, which is a, 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 a European company, has a FDA approval. I would suggest that you, you use those. You have to understand that in these nuclei that are four or five, the nucleus is thicker than you're used to, and so you have to really go deep. It's best to use a chopper that's designed for this. This is one that's designed by um, uh, Roger Steinert, who is a chairman, head of the chairman. Uh, UC Irvine, and it's a very nice, you see it's a long chopper that allows you to go through these very hard nuclei. And the trick is to make sure that, you're, that you understand, again, vertical versus horizontal chopping. I like vertical on most of these that you're seeing here. This slide d demonstrates the maneuvers when you're doing a horizontal. And so when you're doing horizontal, you've got to make sure that you're above the capsule, because if you're not, you're going to split it. And you also have to understand that you can't move your dominant hand because if you do, it'll spin and the nucleus itself will start tilting. So that can cause a, a big problem. And then the, the other problem with these hard nuclei is the very, very leathery posterior part. So what I like to do there is I, is I do multiple small chops, vertical chops, till I get to the very back of the, of the nucleus. And then that last vertical chop well, uh, you can see the, the nucleus, nuclear piece being removed. And the other thing that you can do is you can flip and then you can, and then you can use either a snare, uh, which is uh, now uh, commercially available, or you, or you can then just flip it and do your uh, uh, regular vertical or horizontal chop. You have to be careful making sure that you don't put any sharp nuclear pieces uh, against the posterior capsule. So here we'll see uh, a white cataract, uh, and this is the tripan blue. Tripan can be delivered underneath the air bubble, as, as I've done here, but it can also be, be done uh, if, if you need to put devices in to expand the pupil or, or, and you already have viscoelastic. You simply make a layer of water uh, using just your uh, hydrodissection cannula underneath the capsule, and then you can um, um, put the tripan blue and it'll, it'll stain it. So uh, when, we, when you're dealing with the, these white cataracts, you'll notice here, and I'm backing up to this to, to, to display that, where you can make an, I usually start them with a, uh, with a, a, a sharp cystitome, but also if, I'm, if I think that there's uh, material that's going to come up to the tip and, and possibly come out that might, you might see, for example, in a Borgagnian or, or an intumescent cataract. So here I'm using a, a large 26 or 25 gauge sharp tip. I enter and then before allowing the, the capsular bag to split and create the uh, dreaded Argentinian flag sign, uh, what this allows me to do is I can remove the, the, the uh, flo flocculent 
cortical material, and it, it prevents that uh, uh, capsule from splitting out. Uh, you'll see here, the other trick that we will sometimes do is make our initial rexus four to five, and then after debulking the nucleus, you, you can widen it to five or six towards the end. Uh, again, here I'm going in with a, with a, a little uh, BSS on a syringe to remove flocculent material. And you can see, usually when you see this, these areas that look like they're cortex clear, cortex clear, cortex, those, those, that's usually a sign that, the, that the, the, the lens has a lot of flocculent material and that it's under some type of pressure. So when you see that, make sure that you remove the nuclear or the uh, free morgagnian uh, flocculent cortex before entering with your phaco tip because it's an cha easy chance to, for that to split out. And uh, since the, uh, the, the other value of having staining is if you at any point feel like you have a need for a, a capsular device to stabilize the nucleus or put in a CTR, the uh, fact that this, the capsule stain makes it much easier to define your, your parameters uh, and, and the geometry where, where you need to place these devices. So I'm a, a big proponent of using uh, capsule stains, uh, in, particularly in these type of cases, so you, it protects you from uh, having trouble seeing that, that cortex and seeing the nuclear material. You can see here, this is a divide and conquer type of technique, just creating a, a, a center. You can slowly go down till you get to the whatever uh, piece you have, and then you can see that I was using lots of energy and the nucleus wasn't moved. Then I'll bury the tip, get, get a hold of it, and then the second instrument then occludes. And you have to see that posterior uh, nuclear piece, uh, make sure that it has to be free because if it isn't and you start to bring pieces up, that'll flip the, the, that uh, nuclear piece and that can cause uh, severe zonular stress and capsule rupture. So make sure that you have full control. As you can see here, I'm slowly burying this tip. And then once I get it to, I have excellent control, then I go in with my, my non-dominant hand. And in this case, this is a combination, almost a variation between the uh, chop techniques and you say that instrument's going to go way to the back and free up that posterior leathery portion. The video has a number of different uh, white cataracts for you to, to analyze and to look at. Uh, so I encourage you to, to use the, uh, look at them, relook at them each time and look at, so this is a, a, this is a burst mode I have over here and look at the different kind of modalities that you might, that might make sense to you. Yeah, it's really critical to truly understand OVDs as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So when you're doing a hard cataract, I like to use a very dispersive uh, OVD to protect the corneal endothelium, and I'll often put uh, multiple uh, new aliquots of that in during a very hard case to prevent any nuclear damage. And also, again, remember that the energy you need to keep it away from the endothelium, so you want to be just at or, or below the plane of the iris, and then you really have to, again, understand that flow rate so that you, that you have good control of, of each of these pieces. So in, in this video that you're seeing right here, we are uh, just gaining control of this hemisection, bringing it up to, to uh, divide it, and again, using a burst mode to, to decrease delivered energy and then uh, very changing the modalities so that things happen at, at the rate that you want them to happen. So in, in summary, uh, phaco emulsification really is understanding physics. You need to understand the foot positions, foot position one, fluid on, foot position two, fluid plus aspir uh, vacuum, foot position three is aspiration, flow in, flow out, and, of course, d delivering the right amount of phaco energy to keep things happening at the tip. So again, look at your, whatever phaco unit you have, make sure you have different, uh, th set up differently. For a divide and conquer, you want a lot of energy, you want no occlusion, you want low vacuum. For chop techniques, you need to have good control of the nucleus, so you need to have, be able to bury the tip, 
go into foot position two so that you have control, then either do a vertical or horizontal chop. And you can do that also in a stop and chop where you just bury the tip halfway down and, and then again use your, your uh, non-dominant hand to split the nucleus. And it's important to understand multiple techniques. The fallback is always divide and conquer. But divide and conquer is not as efficient, and particularly on hard nuclei, there's too much movement for, to uh, stresses the zonules, whereas the chop techniques are, are very easy on, on the zonules. And you have to also understand that every nucleus is different. So if, if, things, if you understand the physics, then you can change them as needed on some of these more difficult cases. So it's really important to, to while you're training, to use different foot position, different modalities, even on nuclei that you can do easily so that you learn the control of the foot position and learn the different modalities when you need them for harder cataracts or you need a different thing for softer cataracts. Uh, so with that, I'll wish you a good day. Thank you. That should be Perfect. It. Great. Well, it wasn't perfect.